much, Sam. Um, yes, I, I'm Francisco. I work here at the McCourt Centre. And I, when I'm not busy uh, sampling terraces with Sam, I work in the mountains, especially uh, in, the, in the Italian Alps. I've been working in the Swiss Alps and in French Alps as well. And uh, I'm presenting today on behalf of myself and on behalf of some of colleagues that provided me some of their data and uh, with, uh, with whom I've been discussing some of these topics. And, uh, and uh, this is like uh, work in progress so it's uh, more like uh, uh, um, a reflection that I'm making rather than find results but I wanted to say share it with you to uh, to see if it makes any sense so first of all let's start from the evolution of uh, of uh, upland upland landscapes and parcel landscapes first of all I need to point out what I mean by upland landscapes I mean in the Alps between let's say 1600 and uh, uh, 30 hundred meters of elevation so really high up and these are landscapes that are characterized by the um, uh, absence of trees uh, and uh, by the uh, mm, large uh, green pastures and uh, by uh, an exclusive seasonal exploitation because they're too high to be exploited um, uh, during the winter to be occupied during the winter at least uh, traditionally let's say and these uh, <coughs> landscapes uh, were um, almost unknown archaeologically till uh, the 1991 the year 1991 when some hikers discovered the icemen on in a glacier and archaeologists uh, realized that there were people up there uh, during prehistoric times and, uh, and since the late 1990s some archaeological uh, projects started in the uplands not only in the Alps but also in the Pyrenees and all the other uh, mountain ranges and uh, what was uh, what used to be like uh, uh, an empty archaeological landscape became a uh, complex archaeological landscapes with a lot of features visible on the surface you can see here some examples from the French Alps um, dry stone features visible on the surface or rock shelters occupied since uh, the uh, the Neolithic period or even earlier by hunter-gatherers and then since the Neolithic by, Neolithic by um, uh, by um, shepherds and uh, and then afterwards by uh, those uh, uh, inhabitants of the of the Alps and the other mountain ranges that were looking for um, metal sources uh, um, in the in the Alps. So we now know that there is a very complex uh, um, archaeological there are very complex archaeological landscapes at high altitude in the Alps, and these complex are uh, these uh, landscapes are mainly related to the um uh, exploitation of uh, the pastoral communities. Basically, during the summer, um, shepherds and cattle herders were going up to the to the uplands, to the high pastures, to take their animals and to graze there uh, for the summer months. And uh, they used to bring back their animals to the villages during the summer. Exactly, well, at least is what we assume. Exactly like they were doing uh, till. 50, 60 years ago, and what they are partially uh, doing uh, nowadays. The um, archaeological investigation of the uplands, uh, coupled with uh, uh, a very intense uh, paleoenvironmental investigation, paleoenvironmental study, a lot of lakes and peat bogs have been uh, cored, and uh, the sediment columns have been analyzed to extrapolate uh, the different environmental data uh, and the evolution of the environment. And um, a paleoecologist uh, realized that uh, human impacts on the environment in some in on the upland environment in some areas is evident till the early Neolithic. In some other areas become evident, uh, becomes evident uh, uh, since the, uh, the Bronze Age or even la later and it's not continuous. There, are, there were periods where um, when these uh, uh, impacts was more intense, periods uh, when these impacts was less intense that might uh, indicate a less intense exploitation of the uplands or maybe a different strategy. And uh, putting together uh, paleoenvironmental uh, data and archaeological 
archaeological data enable archaeologists and paleoecologists to reconstruct the human occupation of the high altitudes, at least partially, because the data we have are still quite scanty. But um, we know that uh, um, uh, pastoralism occurred in the Alps since uh, uh, the, the Neolithic and there was as I said an impact on the environment and it developed over time and uh, it continued all during the, uh, the Middle Ages and then since the late Middle, Age, mi um, Middle Ages and the early modern period we have the first uh, accurate uh, documentary uh, um, uh, archive sources that enable us to uh, draw like uh, um, um, some like conclusion about the type of strategies that were carried out up there so otherwise for the previous for the earlier periods we only have uh, archaeological and paleoenvironmental data so we know that pastoralism influenced and had an impact on environment this impact on environment was uh, positive and negative because there are, there are a lot of studies nowadays that document the sustainability the long-term sustainability of pastoral activities or traditional pastoral activities at high altitudes and uh, the only recently uh, archaeological data started and paleoecological data started um, uh, contributing to this uh, evaluation of the sustainability of uh, uh, traditional activities at high altitude and so on and so forth. What I want to point out in this pres presentation is that pastoralism doesn't exist. So it's not a uniform and uh, monolithic strategy. Uh, first, uh, first and foremost, grazing uh, uh, goats, sheep and cattle is different. They have different uh, nutritional requirements. They have a different impact on the environment. The flocks are different. So f uh, sheep and goats can go together, but uh, cattle can do not cannot be grazed to get along together with uh, with goats or with sheep because they have different requirements. They they have different mobility, and they have, and again they have a different impact on the on the soil, on the vegetation, and they eat different types of grass. But the most important thing, and this is a thing that paleoecologists and archaeologists know quite well. But th another thing that um, usually is not considered is that. A different focuses um, have different potentially different uh, approach, uh, different impacts on the on uh, on the landscape and on the strategies that are carried out. For instance, what I'm like to 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 to, ex to explain what I'm what I'm um, referring to. We have a cheese here, and we have some wool there. If uh, the pastoral activity is focused on cheese production, we have a specific type of uh, um, grazing strategy with a specific type of mobility, with a specific type of uh, um, uh, catchment area around, uh, around the, pastoral, the seasonal pastoral site, specific type of animals, so dairy animals in this case. If, we, if uh, the uh, pastoral strategy is focused on the production of the maximization of the production of wool rather than milk for cheese, for cheese production, then we have a different, different type of animals, we have a different mobility, different catchment area and so on and so forth. I don't want to investigate in depth all these all the difference be differences between the uh, the the strategies like a, di a cheese focused strategy and a wool focused strategy but uh, it's quite evident for um, for for shepherds and it should be quite it should be considered by archaeologists that work uh, on pastoralism and then work on upland uh, on upland landscapes. And in order to uh, provide an example of that, I will present three case studies uh, for three different, like um, uh, from three different areas: two in the Italian Alps, Val Modagna and Val Gerone, and one in the Swiss Alps. And for three different chronological periods, but they all have to do with one thing: dairy production. Uh, mm, uh, cheese making in the, at high altitude. Uh, the th um, these three case study 
are ref um, referred to three different time spans. So we have uh, prehistory in the Silvretta, we have uh, 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 late Middle Ages to modern period in Val Valmodagna, and we have uh, modern period in, uh, in Valgerola. It's more uh, an ethno-archaeological case study, the Valgerola one. But they all have to do with cheese production and uh, the different uh, consequences for the environment and for the landscape of cheese production and the transformation of cheese, or cheese production. Let's start from Valgerola. Valgerola is a valley in Valtellina. Uh, here cheese uh, is the really well known, but we will see it afterwards, the really well known uh, uh, Bito cheese is produced, but not only that, they produce also a, like a sort of uh, fat, fat ricotta. Uh, ricotta. Um, and uh, the main characteristic of these uh, um, dairy strategies that uh, is carried out is still carried out uh, in in the uplands and uh, within these let's call it call them traditional dairy um, structures so dry stone huts with uh, an ephemeral uh, roof that is uh, uh, moved from one structure to the other and uh, there are like hundreds of these structures uh, scattered in the upland pastures and they're used uh, in different seasons by different pastoral groups and as you can see there is a cauldron up the, um, in, the, in this structure um, shepherds produced uh, milk, the, the, the milk by hand, and produced the cheese by hand, and transport the cheese to these, uh, um, uh, let's say, cheese maturing areas that are located in, uh, located in, in, the, in the Midlands every, um, every once a week, let's say. So uh, the, the cheese in this case is uh, 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 cows and, uh, and sheep cheese, and is really uh, renowned. So these structures, these dry stone structures are called kalich. The barech are the, uh, dry, the large dry stone enclosures that are used to enclose the animals for, for the night. So, um, as I said, I did like some ethnarchaeology here, so I was living with the shepherds, observing how they were uh, exploiting the landscape, but modifying and interacting with the landscapes, and I was particularly interested in, in cheese production, so I was observing the traditional, uh, the, let's say, uh, uh, yes, traditional way of producing cheese, although tradition is not a way that I like. Um, uh, as you can see, Bito is quite renowned, and is not only renowned, it is also protected by the Slow Food Foundation. This is particularly important for the purposes of my for the purpose of my presentation because the reason why these shepherds can produce cheese in these uh, non EU standard dairies is because they are protected by e by Slow Food Foundations that says Bito cheese can only be produced in these conditions, in this way. Otherwise, it's not Bito cheese. It's always a political, it's a very strong political statement and is the only reason why this type of, past of dairy strategy survives. So, the interesting thing is that uh, the main characteristics of these uh, uh, of this dairy production, of this dairy strategy, are deeply connected, de related to uh, specific um, characteristics of um, uh, landscape management and environmental management. For instance, the reason the I mentioned there are a lot of um, dry stone structures scat scattered in the in the in the area, and uh, these. Uh, um, uh, m maximizes the uh, um, or f uh, fosters an homogeneous grazing and stabling. The fact that there are a lot of shepherds that exploit the area because uh, they can still produce cheese in a traditional way reduces the abandonment of the uplands, and then we have a mix of livestock. All these things, and these are the things that has been the an, um, an aspect that has been observed by uh, by ecologists. All these uh, uh, characteristics of the upland. Um, uh, of the summer um, farming in this area uh, maximizes the control of soil erosion because of the homogeneous grazing, the maintenance of pastoral quality, and it contributes to reduce deforestation because, of course, there is a still an intense uh, pastoral activity in this in this area. 
The second case study, really briefly, is Val Maudagna. In this case, we've carried out uh, historical um, uh, archaeological projects and an ethnological projects. As you can see, we have these still dry stone structures that are still partially in use, but we investigated them archaeologically and we found that this structure in particular that is still as I said, partially in use, I will explain later why partially, it was, uh, was occupied till uh, the um, 15th century. So we have a long-term uh, strategy of, uh, um, uh, of uh, pastoralism and occupation of these structures that is related to the production of these traditional, again, traditional cheese, which, which is called la raschera, which is quite renowned in the area and uh, uh, quite valuable for the local community economically. Um, unlike Valgerola though, pasto, uh, dairy production has started changing in the last 30 years, 20 years, after the EU regulations for uh, a safe uh, and healthy dairy production, especially in the uplands. So as you can see, some shepherds um, uh, started replacing the old dry stone structures with the new ones built by the muni municipality and new uh, new modern dairies have started being uh, uh, built in the area replacing the old structures a lot of shepherds on top of that because they didn't have the money to invest in the construction of new dairies or they didn't want they didn't have the, the possibility to apply for funding for for grants or whatever uh, they uh, turned to non-dairy animals and this changed the profile the composition of the herds and the flocks again we have, as I said, we, there was an homogeneous um, exploitation of the area with a, a lot of structures scattered around and they were replaced, these structures are being replaced by few uh, big dairies and so the grazing and the stabling of the animals changed completely. We have an increased abandonment because of course in the last 20 years because of the new regulation a lot of shepherds couldn't uh, afford uh, taking their animals up there uh, and we have a change in the composition of the herds, com change in the type of animals, in the breeds, in the age composition, in the sex composition and all these changes uh, triggered increased soil erosion because uh, the um, uh, grazing is more localized and is not widespread and uniform um, a degradation of the, p of the pastures for the same reason uh, stabling in one area instead of stabling in different areas means uh, increase in uh, nitrophilus plants and uh, it means again uh, increase in and decrease in the quality of the pasture and uh, and uh, reforestation because of uh, of the abandonment the third and last case study is um, is the Silvretta. Here in the last, uh, in the last uh, 10 years uh, a group of archaeologists have contributed to, um, have, contribu have started um, investigating the archaeological sites in this uh, upland area and we can see some example of these sites. Here we have a dry stone, a dry stone hut and, uh, and an enclosure. And uh, these, uh, these sites uh, uh, turn out to be, some of these sites are not to be prehistoric. And uh, the main phase of construction of dry stone structures, enclosures and huts, was uh, uh, especially the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age between, let's say, 12th and the 8th century BC. Uh, in this project, I collaborated I, um, in this uh, in this uh, in these projects, and uh, in particular, we um, uh, analyzed some pot sheds from uh, these prehistoric sites, and uh, using uh, residue residue analysis in collaboration with the uh, BioArc of the University of York uh, and uh, Oliver Craig in particular, and we found that uh, only the Iron Age pot sheds contain what we recognize to be um, dairy lipids. Uh, therefore, we uh, assume, we uh, interpreted this evidence as evidence of uh, uh, the um, origin of upland dairying, so production of cheese in the uplands during the late Bronze Age and the early 
and the early Iron Age. Interestingly enough, for the same period, we have a uh, clear uh, Paleoenvironmental indication of decrease in uh, in trees, uh, so in the, like a decrease and lowering of the t of a tree line, and an increase in uh, um, pastoral indication pastoral, um, plants related to uh, um, grazing or de um, derived from uh, ag intensive grazing and uh, uh, increase in herbs. So we come to the conclusions. So the uh, argument is that, uh, according to these data, dairy, ac dairy activity seems to be related to, in prehistory, to the profound transformations that occurred in the upland landscapes uh, investigated. Uh, because pastoralism we know that existed before the Iron Age in the Silvretta area that I just uh, um, talked about, but uh, the environmental transformations started being recorded in the paleoecological, paleoenvironmental record only when we start having evidence of, uh, of dairy. For what concerns the other two modern and contemporary case studies, we have evidence that uh, uh, preservation of traditional uh, some daring um, uh, max optimizes and uh, fosters the um, um, uh, sustainability of uh, um, of the of the ecosystems of the upland ecosystems. While on the other side, the decreasing of salmon daring and the transformation of salmon daring um, triggers uh, environmental and landscape degradation. So. From this point of view, I think that uh, we need for a further investigation to understand what's the link between uh, dairy production and uh, uh, landscape and environmental management in the uplands. But we think that from this point of view, we, there is a potential for uh, um, the, the use and investigation of uh, um, daring in historical periods and prehistory as um, in correlation with the study of sustainability and uh, resilience of uh, uh, historical and prehistoric communities and uh, dairy products should not be promoted only because they are good and uh, uh, and healthy and because they are valuable for economic reasons for the local communities but also for their environmental importance because they are correlated with according to these uh, preliminary studies, to sustainable uh, exploitation and management of uh, uh, the upland landscapes. Thank you very much.